Hi everyone, welcome. It's Thursday again. Uh, so we're back on track, normal Thursday um, sessions. We're going to screw that up again next week. Um, so a bit of a fair warning for that, sorry. Um, so to everyone that's on, we've got all the normal gang on. So Paul is on, Jeff's on, all the Allens are on. Um, Paul is on as well as Paula. Uh, one thing I've just seen, um, when you were all waiting, Tim... Good point. So last, I think it was last week or the week before last, um, we talked about um, putting in feature requests. So we'll get back to this later on. But Tim, to your point, yes, Paula did talk about doing the histogram thing um, based on a mast area. If you have a suggestion like that, I'm hoping Paula's done a feature request. Pass it across to Tim. The more people that vote for those feature requests, the higher up the list they go. So genuinely, um, yeah, really good call. If you see something in the next hour, we'll talk about that in a second, um, that is something that you like the idea of, do a search through Capture One's feature requests. If someone else has already asked for it, then upvote it. Now, the more people that, um, that get involved in those feature requests, the higher up they go. So to everyone that is not sure what the on earth I'm talking about, uh, Capture One, that thing there, um, is a piece of software that we use to edit photos. So it's a raw processing um, software which allows us to take what your camera records as raw light coming in as a histogram, and we can then edit that or post-process it, and we can produce, hopefully, images that reflect exactly what you saw, or something more artistic, or anything in between. So we're going to spend the next hour in that program, um, editing like we always do, with your photos, not mine. Um, please make this as interactive as you want. So if you're on live right now, use live chat. Um, please you know, put in comments, questions, all of that stuff, um, and make sure that uh, you get your questions answered, because that's the whole point of us being here. So Capture One itself, uh, current version, as of right now, the latest version, is 15.1. You'll see it marketed as Capture One 22. It's based on the year, so we're in 2022 right now. Um, hi to those people watching next year, but uh, right now we're in 2022. So 15.1 was released uh, last week, I think. Maybe the week before, I get confused. But either way, um, that's the current version. If you are on a subscription with Capture One, then you should be running the latest version anyway, as long as your computer can um, handle it. If you're on a perpetual license and you bought version 22, then all of the version 22 upgrades, so 15.1, 15 15.2.3, whatever, are included in that purchase. And if you're on an older version, you've got a choice. You can stick with that old version. No problem. I don't care. It's not, it's not my photos and my images. It's yours. Um, and if the current version is doing you just fine, then genuinely stick with it if you're happy to. Um, if you want to upgrade, you need to go to CaptureOne.com. Go to your account, which is in the top right, I think, up there somewhere, um, and you'll see different options for you. One thing that was changed uh, a few weeks back was the removal of branded versions of Capture One. So if you own, and I mean that own, so you have a perpetual license uh, for a um, branded version of Capture One, there are some complications in terms of how that license is going to move forward. Um, but essentially, those people that are on the latest version of a branded copy of Capture One, which used to be the cheaper version, will be moved across to the Pro version uh, in April. And obviously, if you're on a subscription, that'll uh, that'll happen too. So we're running on 15.1, the latest version here. That's got all of the new stuff, so HDR merging, pano stitching, uh, Capture One Live that David and I showed uh, last week. It was last week. It's been a long week. Um, and all the other stuff before. Um, yeah, make your decisions, make your choices. That's what we're running today. Before we get into Capture One itself, I want to mention next week. So next week, we're not going to have a Thursday session. The reason being... We're having a Wednesday session, that one. Um, so we've got Chris Burkard uh, coming along. That's a live Q&A session. So for those of you that have questions for Chris, um, and he's pretty um, receptive on social media in general to most people anyway, but um, if you've got a specific question that you want to get into him for that session, then please send it in um, beforehand. We'll make the session interactive anyway, just like we do um, with other ones. We did it with Joe Cornish um, a couple months back. Um, so please get those in ahead of time. It allows us just to uh, make sure that we're not uh, repeating themes and stuff like that. But join in live online. Um, put your questions in at the time as well. Uh, that's going to be next Wednesday, so the 16th of February. Um, I say Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday for anyone who is, where are we, west of pretty much Dubai. <laughs> 
um, maybe parts of India. Um, but effectively, we are at 10 a.m. Pacific time. That's 1 p.m. in New York, which is 6 p.m. in the UK, which is something like 10 or 11 p.m. in Dubai, and unfortunately is like 2 to 4 a.m. for people that are between Hong Kong and Sydney and stuff like that. So people like Alan, I know, sorry, um, you've got a choice. You can either be up late um, or watch the replay. But either way, that'll go out next Wednesday um, instead of Thursday. So all that done, that's all the admin. Let's go into Capture One. So this is Francois's image. Uh, I said we'd sort of pick up on this um, before because Francois sent a couple of images through, um, including this one, which is a nice edit. Um, actually, it was uh, Francois sent it through as a sort of demonstration of what he's learned, which is kind of cool. Um, so our before on the left and our after on the right, that's accessed up here by this little icon or by the Y key on your keyboard. So if I press that, it disappears. Press it again, it appears and I can see what's happening before and after on my image. One thing I forgot to mention a few times um, now is if I have more than one image selected, even if the aspect ratio is different, before and after will always work on both and it's proportional. So a third of the way in on a landscape shot, like this on the right, is a third of the way in on a more square shot. Um, so it keeps up no matter how many you have in your viewer at the same time. Kind of cool. So here is our edit i'm quite happy with this one francois i'm not gonna i'm not gonna dwell on it because there's not really much that i would change um over what you've done you could argue about maybe dropping down um the exposure up on the top just to have it have some fall off before we get um out to a mount if it's going on a wall but in general um it's a nice recovery on highlights nice recovery on shadows um the reflection looks nice really clean these clouds in here, you know, you've got a decision. Some people would choose to get rid of them, so make them more muted, like in the original. Um, others, including you, want to bring them out uh, to show that reflection. So, you know, that's that's all the choices that you can make um, when it comes to that. But, yeah, nice edit. So, therefore, let's talk about this one. <laughs> and what we're looking at is an issue of halos. So, we've covered it a few times over the last few weeks, um, it's been a very sort of similar story about the fact that when you either overdo clarity, in some cases if you overdo um, sharpening and structure, but also if you overdo the high dynamic range um, sliders, you can get this effect, which is almost like a glowing effect. And it happens behind any dark object where there's a mid-toned background behind it, effectively, or, or to the edges of it. And I guess with clarity, it's easier to understand, easier to see, which is the way that clarity works is it's going to look at two borders, so two areas. And let's take this area here. It's going to say the area to the left, is it darker or lighter than the area to the right? And it's darker, obviously. So the dark area make darker again. And the light area make lighter again. Imagine it's doing that at a piece by piece level all the way around all the different areas of the image. But the problem with that is, let's take this area here for an example. Now this is a JPEG, we can't actually go into the raw, I'm gonna go into a different raw in a minute, but this is a good example. Here is where we've asked software effectively to create extra contrast. So clarity is a contrast tool, structure is a contrast tool as well. And it's doing exactly that. It's looking at the bit on the right and saying, okay, you're darker than the sky, so we'll make you darker again, and the sky, well, you're lighter than this globe, so we'll make you lighter again. But then the tool has a problem, because as it goes further out, it says, well, I'm the same tone as you, and the same tone as you, and the same tone as you, and actually, the further out I get, I don't have really any difference. So somehow, it's almost like it's got to get off its horse. So it's, it started riding off with all of this different contrast um, additions. And then as it gets out to this blander, sort of flat area out here to the left, it's got to somehow get back to that standard blue, because it's lightened it here. So what it does is it has this sort of gradient effect, and it effectively releases that change, that brightness alteration, as it gets further away from the edge that it detected. And that's why you see a halo. Now, the more pronounced the contrast is, the stronger that halo is going to be. 
the more you push the clarity slider, the stronger the halo is going to be. But it doesn't just stop there. So that, with clarity, it, it sort of makes sense. You can, you can understand it if you think of it in those terms. If you think about the edge and it goes off into a flattened area, well, how is it supposed to get back to that flattened area without going from its change to back to normal somehow? And it does it over a period of, of area or a, a, a sense of area, which creates this halo. But the second thing that can do this is actually the HDR tool. And it's not for the same reason, but if you overdo HDR, you will end up with these similar halos. And you can get dark halos as well as light halos, and they're typically inside of shapes and areas. So if we look here on Francois's tree, we can see there's not too much clarity, it's not overdone. But the pulling back of the highlights and the pulling up of the shadows, unfortunately, again, those tools are designed to sort of feather off. And as they do that, because if you think about it in, in, a, um, in a sort of pixel level, let's say, if I literally attack the, the shadows, and if you are not a shadow, so you are you know above whatever, what are we going to say? Above 60 isn't a shadow. Then it can't just stop that change. It doesn't literally say, right, if you're a shadow, you get a bump of, where are we, 70. The second you're at 61 on the histogram, so as I move my mouse along here, we can see the orange line here and on the left, and we can also see these numbers at the top. So my shadows, let's say, are here. So these are, you know, 19, 48, 45. Let's say I get across to here, 55. What happens if Capture One just says, right, because you're, let's imagine that threshold is 55. Because you're now 55, there's no impact to you at all. It doesn't work like that because you'd end up with almost a binary effect. And we, we can cause that negative effect by using a really hard luma range. But in this case, what it does is it ramps down. So it slowly, it sort of feathers off that adjustment. So this isn't just shadow it's adjusting. It's going to have the biggest effect in the shadows, but it sort of ramps down as it gets towards the midtones. So if you imagine you have a high contrast area here, as I lift the shadows, it is lifting the shadows, but it's also bringing with it the bits of fall off from shadows. So the bits that are dropping into the midtones, the bits that aren't quite the darkest part of the image, and it's also lifting them a bit too. So you end up, if you push it too far, with this haloing. Um, now, all that said, I think Pascal's just made the point, actually. Um, it can be a choice. So there are some cases, and this is actually one where, where there is an example here, because if I look at the way that the sun operates, well, operates, <laughs> turned up to work this morning, um, you can quite often get that halo around the sun. So if I wanted to emphasize that here, I could do by lifting shadows of the tree, and it would also affect the halo. But in this case, Francois sort of recovered all the highlight of, the, of that sun. So if I just temporarily um, turn this off, for reference, if ever you want to temporarily remove the effect of one individual slider, hold down the Alt key or the Option key on a Mac, while you're holding it down, click and hold the slider. And then when you let go of the mouse first, not the key, um, it will revert back to what it was before. So it's a temporary ability to see what one tool is doing or not. So in this case, this is with just that highlight recovery removed. So we've got a glowing sun. But you can see that halo seems to be less of an impact. Here is highlights all the way back. You're never going to be able to recover the highlights themselves, the, the actual sun. Um, unless you exposed for that, in which case everything else is going to be dark. So you're never going to get this back to detail. But the surrounding area you could pull back. And to me, I'd be in a place where we pull it maybe to there, just to keep it a bit more natural. Same with the shadow. So if I undo the shadow and redo, we can see that this has probably been pulled a little too far. So we're losing contrast. We're losing some of the depth in this image. If I redo what we had in the original edit, it just feels too awake. And what you're seeing is some of this stuff here on the edges of where those shadows are, you're starting to see those um, 
those halos too. So again, highlights, maybe we pull back to there. Shadows, I'm going to pull back to maybe there. And to me, this just feels a bit more natural, a bit less halo-y, which is the other thing. Um, and there's nothing wrong with having some shadows in your shot. You know, it, it, if if there are dark areas of the shot, there are dark areas. That's okay. Um, you might want to try and make sure you can see any details that should be visible. But other than that, I wouldn't worry too much about recovering everything, getting all the highlights back, all the shadows back. You end up with a flat image. And by that, what I mean, let's just clone this. That's what we mean by a flat image. And look what happens to that haloing here. So if I reset our clarity, it's not purely clarity that's doing that. We can see up here on this hill, we've got a little bit of a, a sort of glow around the edges here, which we wouldn't have without that high dynamic range change. So yes, be careful with halos on clarity, but also be careful with the HDR tool because it can have a very similar effect. It's for a different reason, but it is having the same effect and it can result in halos around your image. Um, France, ah, Francois on. So uh, to avoid the halo, we should go back to the contrast slider or go to the curves to pop it. So yeah, it, to an extent. So if we go into our curves, so what I've done here is obviously remove the full impact of the highlights and shadows. In your curve, which ultimately is kind of what all these other sliders are adjusting anyway, but let's just create another clone of that variant. So here's our original, here's our clone. In my curve, I can more subtly reduce down highlights and pull up shadows. And it sort of creates that ramp that you don't notice quite so much. It's still there, it's still obvious. If you push it too much, you're still gonna see it. But I'd say it's arguably better um, sometimes in some images like this one than trying to do all the recovery through the high dynamic range tool. It's it's just it's just gonna pull too much, um, and you're forcing the image to become unnatural as a result of doing it. Right. Um, let's have so, Francois. I'm hoping that answers the question um, that you had. But this edit nice it's a nice recovery um that all works um it's just now your choice as to how you um finish the top and bottom of that um but the halo here is i can tell you now contrast and hdr even without the raw um and the halos in here are just where it's been pushed a little bit too far um and just be be careful of it uh tim yeah to contrast or to uh well i guess to counter i, I guess you mean the, the halo in the tower uh, create two layers, um, sky using magic brush or auto brush and non-sky. Yes. Just, again, be careful. Even if you do that um, on the edges of those layers. So let's... Um, oh, I don't know how this is going to work on a JPEG, but let's have a little look. Let's see if we can. Not quite. Let's just... We've got quite a lot of tolerance already. Let's see if we can. Um, on the edges of your mask... So even in this case here, I'm taking away some of the um, the tower. Um, if I push up our clarity too much, you're still going to get that halo. And the reason is because it's at the edge of the mask and the clarity tool doesn't know what to do. So you can help it because if the goal is to lighten the sky, or let's say the goal is to darken the sky, if you draw a mask over the sky, you don't need to use the shadow or the highlight tool to do it. You can just use the exposure tool to pull it down. So you do have the ability using masks to separate these out a lot more cleanly, but you do it in a different way. Because if you still use clarity, even on a mask, well, as you can see, I mean, this is, don't, don't take this completely um, as gospel because unfortunately it's on a JPEG, but you can see here we've got a mask around the sky as I push my clarity, if I push it too far, you're still going to get that haloing. It's going to look wrong. Um, and the reason is because it's getting to the end of its mask and the clarity tool has to somehow get back to what was there before. So it's done all these changes in the area it can play in. When it gets to the edge, it struggles, basically. So just, yeah, be careful with it. Clarity and HDR as, as tools, 
They can be really great tools, but if you overdo them, it is so easy to tell um, and it doesn't look right. That's that's the challenge with it. Uh, Barry, I'm finding that I'm seeing halos with the new HDR tool uh, without having the auto adjust ticked. What could be done? Ah, so if you mean the HDR merge tool, um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I haven't played with it enough with it. If you've got an example, Barry, send it in um, so I can frankly have a bit of a a look at it but the halo stuff unfortunately is a natural well, natural it's funny isn't it hdr is an unnatural thing but um the halo tool sorry halo tool the hdr tool is almost having to do the same thing it, it can't just say you're a highlight take you you're a shadow take you because you'll end up with what people complain about, which is artifacts. You'll end up with jagged edges. You'll end up with harsh lines where this was taken from the mid-tone exposure, this was taken from the highlight exposure, and there's no blend between. So they have to put a gradient or a feather in between the areas that are being taken from one and, and from the other. And it's that feather and that gradient that drives these halos. So just be the, the first thing is be aware of it um and, and you'll know where to look over time so you'll know to look in the contrast points the areas where it's typically where there's something that's that's a little bit above the mid-tone and its neighbor is a little bit below the mid-tone at the really high extremes you don't tend to notice it so much funnily enough but at those bits where it's sort of slightly light to slightly dark if you overdo clarity or an hdr blend has gone a bit over rigorous or rigorous um that's where you're going to see it so keep an eye on it but yeah send it through um barry if you've got one um we can have a little look um paul i'm struggling with halos in and around trees yeah most people do because <sighs> oops drew a mask there by accident um look how complex they are and that's the challenge now in this particular shot um francois has a luma range in there um, because of a weird thing um, with Luma Range, we can't go into his historical one. But some of it can be got about by or, or got around by creating. Let's just create a new field layer, in fact. And let me go to my Luma Range. And while we're in our Luma Range, in fact, let's just zoom right the way in. So while we're in our Luma Range, we're going to be really fussy about the selection. So we're we're going to take out all of the really bright stuff and also take out yeah see this is the problem look i'm trying to take out some of the tree i can see the surrounding sky is starting to lose um or starting to fall out of the the selection but fall off here is your friend so the longer these ramps are the softer that fall off is between what's in the mask and what's not in the mask also a radius tends to feather the edges as well so if i look at the mask in grayscale so a lot of people don't use this one but it's really valuable we can see that mask now applying there and if i were to then let's say uh i don't know increase our exposure or decrease our exposure don't again don't push it too far if i do that we're going to get some weird stuff going on but if i want to just drop it by maybe i don't know a third of a stop a luma range is probably going to do a better job in the detailed parts than what uh, an hdr um, approach would or the hdr sliders so yeah it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tough one but yes on your luma range and i've just seen it um so <laughs> francois yeah fall off is important especially around trees and leaves because if you look in here, you know, these leaves are, especially when you look, we're at 900% almost. When you're looking at the edges of the leaf, it's not a strict line. It, it does fade off. So if my Luma range is too harsh, let's just turn on our mask here. If I have these set to here and here, look at what happens to the mask. We'd see all these artifacts. And let's look at our grayscale mask so you can see. It's because the mask has gone to be so binary that it's either in or out there's no gray excuse the pun, but there's no gray area there if i have a nice i don't know why that keeps popping down there but if i have a nice fall off with a nice radius we can see how nicely this mask starts to drop off around those leaves and this gives me a lot more control um, over brightness without introducing a, a halo 
Uh, or are we Jed? Uh, what about brushing within the object and then feather it so the clarity is less at the edge? You can. Um, so let's take you know this this mask for example. Um, of course, I've got a luma range on this mask there. But what I could do is rasterize that mask, which means stop it being a luma range, make it as if I've painted it, and then right click and go to refine mask or feather, and I can see on my all well, my tools seem to be down the bottom today. Um, let's just go into our grayscale mask so you can see it a bit better. So under my refine mask, which I'm going to have to obviously drag back up, um, we can see how much it's feathering, how much it's finding similar regions to include in the mask, dissimilar regions to exclude from the mask. So with no refining, we get this very sort of intricate hard line. Well, not hard, but it's certainly harder. Um, when I go to refine it all the way up, you get a lot of softness brought into the mask. And that'll probably help a little bit in terms of um, not noticing those boundaries. Um, but yeah, it, it, there are different ways of doing it. Um, but each of them has a positive and a negative. Um, Robert, why not make the tree color a mask? Yes, ish. So we could, but you're also going to have this problem where, so if I look at our color wheel, for example, um, and we were to pick our, let's go for that color there. You know, on the color wheel, we've got the selection, which can be smooth. They call it smoothness on here. If I change this dial, you see how wide from this wedge we're going to include in the selection. So at this point here, there's nothing other than that particular wedge included. And actually, if I just turn on view selected color range, you'll see everything else turn gray. So again, I want that nice fall off, remember, um, around the edges of the leaves. And the problem is around the edges of the leaves, you see they're gray. And it's because they're actually picking up some of the sky. They're a little bit blue. So I want to include all of the tree, but also some of the blue. Now, here's the problem. I can change my smoothness on this, this wedge, and it can go up, and it can start to include oranges and greens and, and all that good stuff. But I can't really get it round to the blue. Even if I go to maximum smoothness, I would have to almost create this mask or color selection to get those edges that are in blue and, and cover it. So what I'd then have to do instead, if that's not going to work, is go to here and we'll go to create a mask layer from selection. So I'm saying to capture one, take everything in this shot, which is this yellowy orange color, create a mask layer, including the bits. So it's actually pretty wide that smoothness so create a mask layer it's going to mask it and let's just have a look at our mask okay it's got everything that was yellow and orange but look at the edges it's not going to get those things and if i make changes to this let's just do it increase them you're going to see the edges look odd um, because the edges weren't included because they were a little bit blue so what you'd then effectively have to do is what i just um, did with the other mask Let's go onto a grayscale mask. You can see it's very binary. Uh, right click, refine mask, and we can get it to expand that mask. Refine mask is one of the most underused things, which is actually really, really useful. Um, but we can apply it to a color range based mask. We can apply it to a luma range rasterized mask or whatever. Um, so whatever you want to do with it um, will work, but you're going to end up in the same place, which is trying to get the leaves covered, some of the, the sticks and the twigs when the branches covered, um, without creating halos all the way around everything that you've drawn. So same issue um, each time. It's just there are different ways to come at it. You can use the HDR tools and the clarity tools in moderation. If using them results in something that's overdone, then back away, maybe try the curve. If the curve doesn't work, then maybe you do need to mask it. And you can mask it using a Luma range, using Magic Brush, using a color range, individually drawing it if you want. But in each case, think about that feathering. Think about that refined edge. Think about softening the transition between what you're going to make a change to and the surrounding area so you don't get those halos. Um... 
Laura, could you use the skin tone editor to make the sky likeness more uniform? Yes, you could. Um, but then you're sort of chasing your, if you mean after when you've got the halos, like you're, you're starting to chase um, like the bright area here and the dark area here. So yes, we could. Uh, let's create a new filled layer. Let's go to our color editor, go to the skin tone tool. And I'm going to say, I want all of the sky to be about this blue here. So quite smooth. So include all of the blues around here. And now I want to make sure that the hue, the saturation, and the lightness across the whole sky is more uniform. You can see it's had a good effect. So if I just undo and read it, let's just turn off our view selected color range. That's confusing things. So that's without big halo. That's with not so much of a halo. But I'm correcting, so it, it, by effectively doing these bits here, which is the, the uniformity of that sky, so I've chosen the blue color, told Capture One I want to include this wedge as well as quite a long spread outside, so it's got all of it, and then tell it in uniformity, I want all of everything inside this wedge to be very similar hue, very similar saturation, 100% similar lightness, we'll get a flat sky. But it starts to look a bit fake. Because it's also, remember, starting to include some of those twigs. Remember, they also have blue in them. And we're effectively correcting something that we could have corrected in the first place. So if we're trying to do that to get rid of the halo, it's a bit of an issue. Um, I would say go back to the drawing board and maybe review how the halo got there and, and find a way of, of removing it. Uh, Anthony, refine mask, what's a good amount of pixels? It depends on how it, there is no answer. It, it depends on how intricate the the detail is, the the megapixels of your camera, um, the area that you're covering. Um, you, you literally need to just um, adjust it on that slider. What I would do with refine is make sure that the mask you're using is the grayscale mask. Um, let's look at, uh, where are we? This one here, so Francois's original one. Um, if I go to refine the edge, so zoom in a little bit, um, go to refine mask, and with our refine button, it's easy to see what's happening when you've got the grayscale mask on. It's not so easy when you're either dealing with red or no mask. Um, so when you're doing refine mask, I would switch to display grayscale mask instead of um, instead of the standard. Um... Where are we, Paula? Such a uniform sky feels very natural. Yeah, it does. That's the other, the other downside of of trying. In order to get that halo to disappear out of the sky, which is this one, I've got to flatten the sky so much. It, the sky isn't flat like that. Um, so, yes, of course, you can use the skin tone tool to do it. It's a it's a very good tool for this sort of thing. But I'd question. You know, do I need to if I just fix that halo in the first place? Right. Um, so Francois got a lot of um, a lot of time pulling apart his picture, I'm afraid. Um, but yeah, you, you you hopefully now know the the issues. So I, I say this quite a lot, but only ever use a tool in Capture One if you have to. Every button you press, every slider that you use in Capture One risks your image quality so use the tools you have to not just because they're there every single time i move one of these sliders i have a positive effect that i want and i will often have a negative effect that i didn't want and you've got to balance those out okay so this shot is alf's uh challenge i saw this on the facebook group the other day um and it was around printing from memory um, so this was our before, this is our after, and I'm saying it's coming out really dark, um, on the printer. My suspicion is in part, it's your, um, calibration. I think we, we talked about it a little bit sort of by, by typing. Um, so well, monitor calibration, printer calibration, this stuff is the stuff that it will take a long time to get your process properly refined and have your screen matching your printer you know use the proof profiles um, so on the view um, if you view recipe proofing then we're seeing what our recipe itself is actually um, 
is actually uh, producing. So if you don't have your process tab, a lot of people didn't um, after version 21.3 or something like that, um, it's renamed as export. So the traditional export tool has moved. It's now this big export tool, big window, but you can still have it in a tab with the queue going on for when you're doing things in the background. But more importantly, it's going to show you in your proofing view what's happening based on the format of my export and the ICC profile. So this is set to Adobe RGB. It's what I tend to edit in most of the time. If I were to change this to a... I'm going to go off the screen, but a coated paper, so a CMYK paper, we're going to see a simulation of what that printout is going to be on that paper from this image. Now, it does depend on whether or not um, your monitor is calibrated, whether your printer matches, all that, lots and lots of variables. But if you are trying to edit for print, then switching on under the view menu, switching on your recipe proofing is actually useful because it means that when I'm editing, it's showing me what's going to come out based on the recipe I've chosen. If I change the recipe, this one happens to be sRGB. This one is sRGB as well. So let's just change this TIFF one back to Adobe RGB. So if I change the recipe, it's going to change the way my picture looks throughout and across every single tool and every single tab. But there is another thing with this shot, which is um, I'm going to turn off proofing just because that's annoying at the top <laughs> more than anything. Um, there is another problem with this shot if it's just about the darkness, which is is this shot dark? Yes, it is. Um, if I do my before and after, there is our original. There is our finished shot. And what Alf's done, quite rightly, is pulled up. You know, there's a brightness pull up here. Um, we've got a foreground with the shadows lifted, with the black lifted. Um, we've got a sky layer as well with some whites lifted up more. So maybe um, to accentuate the stars and the sun. Um, and then a final adjustment layer on top. But all of those things are still leaving most of our data down here in the, the grungy part of the histogram, not in the bright part of the histogram. So let's just create a floating tool because I want to really show you this. I'm going to create a tool with histogram. And rather than looking at the picture, let's look at the histogram. You can't see that because of my head. <laughs> There we go. We've got this tiny little lump here of, of really bright stuff. Now that obviously is going to be this sun here as I move my mouse around. You know, there it is, the orange bar's moving along and it's that stuff up there. As I move around the sky, the orange bar moves down and it's more and more and more the detail that's in the shadow all the way down to here where it's almost off the histogram. So that's giving me a, a flavor of what um, what data we've got to deal with but it's not necessarily helping me with printing other than I don't want to push this right side more because there is data all the way along the temptation would be to go into levels and say right we're going to just do that with brightness now all that's going to do is just effectively lighten up the bits that were already like push them to be overexposed so we may have some issues in some areas and also then proportionately lighten up the other areas all the way down to zero. But instead, what would happen then if I just move our midpoint, so the midpoint of the levels tool? And as I do that, we can lighten up the image. It's not pushing anything of the highlights out. So they're not they're not moving. The highlights are staying at 255. It's also not pushing any of the shadows off, nor was the previous one, but that's not moving either. But with this change, I go from there to there. I'm only in the foreground. Sorry, should have done that uh, in the background one. So let's go to our background and we pull that there. So with that change, when I go to print this, is it going to be brighter? Yes, it is. It's still going to be dark. Let's just read that histogram. 95% or more of the data in this shot is below the bottom quarter. It's in the shadows. So you have a shot where 95% of the data is in the shadows. Without that change, 99% of the data is in the shadows. 
So that's with shifting the midpoint. That's with leaving it where it was. So am I surprised that it prints out dark? No, not at all. Um, I'm surprised you can see stuff in, in some ways, given how dark the overall image is. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It, it doesn't mean that there's a problem with it being that dark. But if the expectation is that it would come out lighter, I would literally, I'm just going to remove that tool, I would shift that midpoint and potentially, if you want to, shift this brighter point here. But just bear in mind, like I said, what it's going to do to those highlights is going to push them off. So that there was it uh, before. I'm guessing that's the moon. If it's not, well, no, it must be the moon. There's stars. <laughs> um, but as I pull this side, the highlight side, further in, the stuff that was, let's say, 210 is now beyond 255. So you're getting this blowout here. And I wouldn't recommend it. I would keep to using the midpoint adjuster here. And that's going to lighten things up. Um, so it's not going to necessarily get you to a perfect place without some printer calibration, without some screen calibration, you know, really, really refine that. And, and, and what I mean by that is print this with X profile, see how it comes out, compare it to your screen, print it with Y profile, see how that comes out, compare it to your screen. And it's an iterative process until you get to the point where your screen is calibrated for your printer. So there's no surprises. But one thing I do see a lot of people do is they have their screens too bright um, or they have their rooms too dark. Um, we talked about this before, but the temptation is to work in a dark room. That doesn't work for print because when you view your print, you're not viewing it in a dark room. The print doesn't have any light coming out of it. You have to shine light on it, which is the opposite to your monitor. So if you're in a dark room with a bright monitor pushing all of your image towards your eyes, it's going to appear a hundred times brighter than what comes out of that printer at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> Paul, it's an expensive process. Yeah, it can be. Um, and, and if you're using a, an external print solution or provider, they can help with it. They can provide you ICC profiles. They can help give you guides in how to, to get your stuff uh, matching their output. But it's, it's not free to get it perfect. I, in a lot of cases, you're not going to need perfect. You need sort of 90% um, and you can get it. Um, <laughs> are we talking about printing? I love printing. We are, kind of. Um, but you'll understand, hopefully, because we get this question every now and then saying, can we do a session on printing? We can do a session on parts of printing, individual parts, recipe proofing, um, calibration of your screen, um, paper types. We can do all that stuff. But there is no such thing as a generic guide for this is how to print correctly out of Capture One because unless that person has your system with your screen in your environment and your printer with your paper and your cartridges or if it's a light jet or whatever that your laser beam um there's no way of giving you a generic answer to this is the right setting it's just not possible um, but yes for a dark image um with black point compensation the luma curve should be used yeah you you can do so yes we've got this midpoint here you can also in your luma curve Click here, and again, I would protect the shadows. I would protect the highlights, and the way that you do that is you're going to lift up the middle, not do the, you know, the traditional S-curve. So the default, everyone learns this. Ah, curves, great, I'll do an S-curve. Well, that's going to make the shadows darker and the highlights lighter. So what if we do it this way? We make the highlights darker and the shadows lighter. We're losing contrast now. We don't want that. All we want to do is just bump up the middle. Lift that, the, all of the values apart from the darkest and the lightest, lift them. That's all we want to do and, and taper it off at each end. So either way, um, whether it's using levels, whether it's using curves, whether it's using you know, midpoint adjustments, it, it doesn't really matter. But yes, if, if your print is coming out too dark, check the calibration, but check your screen, check your environment. Um, this here, I mean, you can't see my full um, office but um this is not the setup that i use for editing it's too dark and my screen is frankly too bright so we have to have different setups for different tasks and, and this is one of them um tip for printing lower the screen brightness at least 50 percent potentially uh it depends on your screen obviously but in general terms you know if you look at uh, an xdr display it's at 1600 nits i think max brightness 
for print, we'll drop this down to 500, 600 maybe. Um, so yes, having an ultra bright screen is wonderful and for watching videos and editing that sort of stuff and editing and, and viewing online content is fantastic. Stuff that's designed to be seen backlit is wonderful. But stuff that's meant to be on a piece of paper that relies on ambient light to be able to see it, it's the wrong thing to do to have your screen so bright. Uh, won't be able to help. Um, Jamie, trial and error is a problem when you're using a third party for printing. It is, but one thing I would say, a good third party printer, and there are several, certainly in the UK, I know lots in the US, and, and actually Australia has some great ones too. Um, some really great, one that really surprised me the other month. Um, but if you work with a good partner and you talk to them about, look, I want to calibrate to your systems, they will run test strips. So you're not just burning off loads and loads and loads of prints at, at, at cost. Um, they'll work with you with profiles. And, and my argument on it, if you're not getting that from that print provider, maybe look at different print providers because the, the good ones will do that because they know that this is a problem and they know it's something they need to help you with. Um, Brian, notice a very pronounced difference between printing with photographic process, yeah, silver halide paper, so light jet um, world versus laser jet versus, I'm, I'm guessing you might also mean ink jet rather than laser jet. But yes, the, the process of um, light jet on a roll of light sensitive paper versus laying down CMYK and other ink onto um, you know, pigment based um, receptive paper. Uh, it's going to be very, very, very different um, in the way that it lays it down. And this is the thing. That, hence, if someone says to me, my screen is perfectly calibrated for print, okay, for what print? For what printer? Because depending on your printer, you may have to make some calibration changes. So there isn't, unfortunately, one answer. Um, Francois, is it not a bit too dark to be printed? Yes, um, but um, if you, you know, if you make the right tweaks to here, I'd say that can work. Um, it's just get. It's about getting it off of this left-hand wall, pushing more data into the middle um, to be able to be seen. Um, Jamie, yeah, subjective, really. I like it. Yeah, I, I agree. And actually, that's the other thing. Um, don't discount the fact that sometimes um, images are meant to be seen on screen, and if it is, screens are brighter. They're they're higher contrast sometimes. Um, so. You know, don't discount them. Um, it's just going to depend on on what people like. Um, so, where are we? Mario, how do you deal with Mac OS stuff like True Tone or Night Shift? I turn it all off, is the answer. Um, it's one of the worst things you can do for calibration and photography. So, it's not just Mac anymore. PCs do it too. Um, it's a really good thing. So, late at night, your screen will start to warm up and it will start to change its brightness automatically and stuff like that. Turn it off. If you're using your computer to edit photos, you need consistency. I do not want my screen or my computer deciding how warm or cool I'm looking at an image. And it is pronounced. So that screen can change from you know 39,000 Kelvin to 6,000 Kelvin through night shift and, and true tone and stuff like that. It means that I could be editing the photo in the evening, cooling it down because it's too warm, Look at it in the morning and it's now way too cold because my screen has reset to cooler again for daytime. So turn it all off on your computer that you're using for editing. It's great for office work, great for emails, but not for um, not for other stuff. Um, there we are, test prints, test prints. There we go. We're not going in the we're not going in the printing hole. Um, so what about a profile from a color checker, says Yoris. Um, I can't get pure blacks anymore when I use them. You should be able to, but yeah, if you if you load in a color um, a profile from a color checker and you load it into your recipe, you should be able um, to get there. So unless I've misunderstood, maybe there's something wrong with um, the profile that's coming in. Um, Hans... Your keen should be possible to print out a capture one and not via TIFF and the some print program. Yes, it is. Um, many people print out a capture one. Um, it's it's a choice. You can choose um, to use an external print um, provider. You, you know, I can print out of Photoshop. I can print out a capture one. I can print out of Affinity. I can print out of Preview if I want to. Um, but 
yeah, Capture One's print module works. Um, it works for many people. Um, it, some people choose that it will decide that it doesn't have all the features they want. They want to add white borders. They want to have multiple up on one page and all that sort of stuff. It doesn't quite do that. Um, hopefully it gets built a bit better. Um, but yeah, there's, there's nothing there um, that would stop a normal print coming out um, of Capture One. Uh, JD printing is a topic I avoid because I have no need to print. Um, yeah, the, I mean, the, there are sessions out there that will talk about it, but the one thing I would guarantee is that it won't talk about your specific use case. Um, it's a case of trial and error. Right, let's get out of that rabbit hole quickly and go into Ken's shot. Um, so the question that Ken had is, is there any, well, effectively, has he done a good job on recovering the highlights? Is there anything more that we could do? So let's just do our uh, before and after. And what's gone wrong here? Why can't I see a before and after? And it's because this is a DNG output, as is this one. This is the original raw file. So normally I would see in an EIP um, all of these things packaged up with all the changes. In this shot from Ken, I can't see the changes that he's made, but I can see the difference between the original and this one. So I'm going to load these up side by side to do that. You're going to hold down the uh, command key or control key on Windows. I'm going to turn off edit selected because if I have edit selected turned on, as I make changes, we're going to risk if I copy anything, it's going to apply to everything um, that I've got selected at the same time. And I don't particularly want to be doing that. So to be safe, I'm going to leave that off. And it means that I can zoom in and compare on this left-hand side one, which is the original. So let's turn on our exposure warning. On the original, huge amounts of stuff that's overexposed. On the edit that Ken's done, that's not too bad. Um, but if we're just looking for the question of, could more have been um, removed, recovered, improved, whatever else, Here's where we're going to have a problem, and I've, I've covered this a little bit before, but let's just go into here in detail. In fact, no, let's go to our raw, sorry. Let's take our exposure. So if this is an exposure warning, and I want to get rid of the overexposed bits because it's too bright, let's pull the exposure down to there. Great. So I can see more sky, and I can see a bit here, but... There's no texture in here. So there's no warning now. The exposure warning is on. So it's saying it's no longer overexposed. But there's no more detail. So you almost get to a point where there was no point. Because all we're doing is we're darkening down the brightest part of the image. What was 255 is now, look at the top, 233. But it's a flat 233. There's no data or detail in there. So all I'm doing is darkening highlights but not getting anything back. What I do get back, however by doing that is a bit more information in these clouds up here. So you can see that darkened up here has got a lot more um, texture up there than in this DNG. Now the DNG, I can still pull some stuff back. So if I pull our exposure, we can see that here. So in this version here, I'm gonna start from, from Ken's edit. I don't know the full extent of everything that was done, but it's obviously been warmed up a bit and um, maybe some shadow lift too. But up here, I'm not going to try and pull back this. There is no point. Um, it's already been pulled back a little bit. You can see it's sort of 249, 254. But I do want to get the sky back. So we'll create a new layer. Um, a How will we do this? Let's do a, a gradient layer. Just like that. And I'm going to go to my Luma range. And we're going to select the area of the sky that is bright, so 100%, and then drop it off, because I don't want to affect all this stuff out here. I don't want to, bear in mind I'm going to use exposure to bring it down. I don't want to be darkening the whole sky over here. I just want to be affecting the brightest parts. Now think back to what we said with Francois's image at the start. If I do this, I'm going to see some drop off here, hard lines. So I drop the exposure on this side of the line, that side of the line doesn't happen. Um, in fact, let's just make it even worse. Let's just do that. Okay. So now I'm going to drop my exposure. Great. Look at those lines. And that's because our fall off wasn't soft enough. So I can use refine mask or I can go into my Luma range. Let's just turn on the display again. 
and change this fall off so that it becomes more subtle and soften that radius. Go to apply and we lose all of those hard lines, but we get back all the detail in the sky. Now that's probably, bearing in mind this brightness here, I've got all my detail back, but it's a bit too much. So I'm just gonna pull it back maybe to two thirds of a stop back. And that's all I'm gonna do. So we go from there to there. I get more detail back, but not to the point where we're doing anything silly like this. Um, it only needs, you know, one or two, well, a, a third or two thirds of a stop just to get the detail back in there. There's nothing you can do to recover this part here. If it blew beyond 255, even in the raw data, you're not going to get it back. What we can do overall with this shot is bring up a bit of brightness, which won't necessarily hit this too hard. Um, it's not going to brighten it up too much. But that just lifts the overall feel of the shot and we get some of this detail back here. Not much more um, than that. If you push it back more, um, you're going to start to get that fake of feel to it where you can, you know, you can see crazy details in the highlights, but it doesn't make sense because the highlights were obviously blown out because we can see that on the reflection. So just think about the whole image together. Don't just look at one section. Think about, does this make sense? If all of these clouds were so dark, in fact, let's just pull that back a bit. If they were all really dark and really detailed, does it make sense that the sun was that bright that I'm looking into? So you've got to just um, bear the two things in mind. Uh, Pascal, what's the difference between light, sorry, fall off and radius in a luma range? They seem to do more or less the same thing. No, they don't. They really, really don't. Um, so let me, let's just create a new, oh, let's just fill that mask. So I'm going to choose this ship. And I'm going to show you using the grayscale mask, which might help um, to understand this. So our luma range, you're going to discount anything bright and discount anything too dark. So there is my ship with no radius and also a normal fall off. Now, fall off relates to the histogram. It does not care about shape. It doesn't care where it is. It doesn't care about edges. It doesn't care about any of that stuff. It says, if you are 58 in the histogram, then you're included in my mask. If you are less than 58, you are not. If you are more than 108 excluded, less than 108, you are in my mask. As I move the fall off specifically, you can see extra areas are added and it is extra areas. So they're up here. It's nothing to do with the existing shape of what I've uh, masked. It's about the values of the histogram. So now it's saying anything more than two or 25 include, but only a little bit, 26, a bit more, 27, a bit more, 28, a bit more, all the way through to 58, where it's 100% included. Same at the other end. 108 is 100% included. 109, a little bit less. 110, a little bit less, all the way down. But it does not care about the shape of, Luma range is irrelevant to the shape in this sense. Radius takes the edges of what's included in your luma range and it softens them and it goes a little bit beyond those edges it's looking for similar shapes it's kind of like refine a bit like refine mask but you can see it's effectively feathering the decisions that it made at the edges of the mask that's been driven by your range and your fall off so they work together if you think about it as range is what's included Radius is how softly to fall off, or fall off, bad word, but radius is how softly to end that inclusion and also how far out to look from this luma range to include things or discount things from that mask. So it's a slightly different thing, but it does deliver a very different um, result. So hopefully that answers that one. Uh, using brightness instead of exposure. Yes, Joe, except for the fact that on... This area out here, remember brightness is more of a squash. It takes the stuff that's in the, the brightest areas of the images and squashes it into the histogram. This is about grabbing data that's actually off the end of 255. So for that exposure, I'm happy with um, just to pull a bit more, a bit more data in um, to that one. Um, I think that's it for questions on this one. Um, Okay, so, oh, where are we? Alan, could you clone the sea over the blown section? You can, but again, I get to the point of 
Does it mean that we then look um, a little bit false because you know the shadows are coming from a light source? Um, this is lighting up somehow. The, the sky is lighting up there somehow. I'd just be really careful. You know, we we could try, but you know, the, the problem that I have with it is I've obviously got a light source up here. I don't think there's a problem with having that reflection out there. I, th I think it's okay. What I think is more of a problem, and we, we need to fix this before we disappear, <laughs> is on Ken's shot, trying to get the horizon straight. So we need to make sure that one's done um, on every shot. But other than that, um, yeah, in answer to your question, Ken, I don't think you can do much to recover that if you want to leave that spot in there. Um, as Alan says, you know, yes, you could use um, the heal or clone to get rid of that blown section, but it's up to you. Um, whether that's real okay so reminder next wednesday uh rather than next thursday so live session q a um you know put your questions to chris he will answer as many as we can um during that time um so join us at 6 p.m in the uk so it's a bit later than normal but it allows for the us um, to be online and him to be up <laughs> um so that's next week. Uh, in the meantime, we have that Facebook group. So go forward and join in that conversation on there if you wish to. Um, we'll also put announcements and stuff like that in there as and when they come up. Uh, in between now and next week, or in fact, the next session, um, send in your files. So poorreforlive.wetransfer.com. Include, if you can, an EIP or a, a, an edited file so that we can actually see what you've done um, and, and try and help. But list uh, in there what you want to have a look at and also include your name. No name, we can't edit it, I'm afraid. Um, but in between now and then, look after yourselves. Um, get in touch if you need to. But stay safe and we'll see you next week with Chris. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.